Dear participants, dear colleagues and friends, welcome back again. We continue our summer school. At new stage, in more advanced stage, quantum horizons, developments and opportunities with Alexander Sergeyenko. You already know Alexander Sergeyenko. He gave ex an excellent lecture in the first part of our school. He's a professor at the Boston University, as well as he's a part of our institute as distinguished associate member. He's a, a distinguished scientist, wonderful person, a true friend of uh, our institute, as well as my academic brother from Moscow State University. Alexander, thank you for coming again, and please begin your, your talk. All right, well, thank you very much. Uh, it's, it's a pleasure to be back. Uh, just a second, let me just uh, uh, start uh, my presentation. Here the screen. Okay, uh, just a second. Can you see my screen? Yeah, it's okay. And a pointer, okay, good. Um, pointer is okay. Yeah, all right, very good. Uh, well, uh, good afternoon. And uh, oh, just a second, one thing I need to do. Hold on for a second. I just changed the view, so I will remove. Uh, uh, share the screen and all right. Uh, well, uh, the subject, uh, just I uh, just want to remove this. Uh, okay, perfect. Well, uh, today uh, I will talk about uh, a little bit more advanced topic. The first lecture was more like uh, basic introductory things for uh, general description of entanglement and as a major resource in quantum information processing. Well, today I would like to talk about our recent uh, research uh, discoveries and achievements uh, that uh, deal with uh, uh, like a new small branch in quantum optics, quantum information processing. And uh, I would like to talk about, I'll introduce what it is and uh, I'll show a couple of uh, potential applications of this technology that are very, kind of useful in uh, quantum information. And this will be about the higher dimensional uh, horn go mandel effect and uh, reconfigurable entangled state networking. And it all will be done using new linear optical multiports. So uh, I'll talk briefly about uh, quantum optical information processing and manipulation in optics, what is used for that. Namely, uh, the most common element for, for this is conventional linear optical uh, elements such as uh, beam splitter that realizes Hadamard transformation uh, of qubits and has dimensionality of two by two. Uh, then I'll introduce our new unit that could be three by three or four by four and it's based on a slightly different physical principle of operation than uh, just simple beam splitter. It's more complex, but it achieves and delivers more capabilities. Uh, and as an example, I'll discuss the higher dimensional Hongo Mandel effect. And I show that this could be used as the universal switching element for two photon correlated and entangled states. And since we have switching elements, then we can try to build up um, a, a network of nodes and switch those quantum states to go to route them inside the quantum ne network so they will be delivered to a particular user. So, um, 
Uh, well, first of all, um, so that's again comment this floating term. Um, beam splitters and quantum information. So we all know that uh, it's um, uh, the beam splitter has been used in quantum optics from the very beginning. Uh, remember the Henry Brown trees experiment and uh, many, many, many experiments after that Hongo Mandel experiment and uh, all other quantum information processing. Uh, so it's based on the fact that uh, you have two input modes, one and two. It's right here, it's an input state. And you can have uh, two outgoing modes, three and four. Uh, and they are connected uh, through the two by two matrix. And uh, this matrix actually could be represented in a slightly different way without eyes, but with one, one minus one. And uh, it's a standard Hadamard transformation that is well known. And uh, because it's a two by two matrix and our qubits are two dimensional entity, it's like qubit, it's a vector zero and one. And that, that's why so many modern technologies are using Hadamard to operate on qubits and in optics, beam splitter is the element that's supposed to execute this transformation. So um, it's a nice device, uh, but we call it directionally biased because if you come from one and two, you only can go out through three and four. There is no way you can go back. So it's only going in one direction here. Uh, because of that, uh, if you use it once and you want to use it again, you have to put another beam splitter. Like if this is the first one, then the second one will be here, the third, fourth, and so on. So uh, you have to increase the number of physical elements uh, on the way of your photons to execute particular operations. And because in uh, quantum information, you need to have multiple operations, you have to do it multiple times. And it basically it's immediately leads to the situation when the number of real estate required for execution is growing basically exponential. You start with one and very quickly, it's dozens of those beam splitters. And uh, you have seen this in uh, modern uh, quantum information, uh, the optical photon in photonics quantum information, the multiple beam splitters uh, and waveguides right here, uh, or like this is a discrete element. This is the integrated version of that. Because in principle, to put this number of beam splitters in discrete elements, uh, is very difficult. Uh, the only way to do it is to go to, I think, to China. And uh, there is a, you have seen probably a recent experiment uh, from uh, uh, Professor Zhang Wei Pan group, where you have really huge amount of beam splitters, mirrors, and everything sitting on optical table, executing some type of um, uh, quantum operations. And uh, why it's possible? It's possible because of this first original work of Michael Rack and Anton Zeilinger uh, that uh, really had shown that using beam splitters and uh, these, these beam splitters and two by two Hadamard transformations, uh, multiple of them, but positioned in particular way, you can, in principle, execute any unitary transformation of any order. So that was the theorem proven, and then those experiments, they just prove this. Okay, uh, and uh, our initial idea was, uh, can we by any chance first reduce the number of ele elements? Well, how you can reduce the number of re elements required uh, for the execution of particular operations, can we reuse them? Just use beam splitters again, 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 or any other elements again. So to do that, they have to be reversible. But the beam splitter by itself is not reversible. As we know, 
it can only go in one direction. So uh, we try to introduce a new design. Uh, this is the unit, uh, three by three with three, three ports, port A, port B, and port C. The photons can come from any of these ports, A, B, and C. So that could be the input state. One photon here, one photon here, and one photon here. So since we have three photons coming in, the structure of this unit allows the photons to go inside and either get reflected from the beam splitter, like this direct pass through or get reflected. For example, when it comes to the next beam splitter, it can either pass through and go out or get reflected from the mirror with the phase shift. This unit, green one, is right here. It's a mirror accompanied by the phase shifter. And it can go backwards here and again. So the photon can come in, but at every single interaction with the beam splitter, it has a 50% chance to pass through and leave the unit. So if you calculate what happened, you, you introduce the photon from port A, and you calculate what happens with this uh, photon after like 10 consecutive, consecutive interactions with element inside the unit, you will find that after like uh, 10 interactions with beam splitters, for example, it's 99.9% .9 is already left the system. So you can say, okay, the time on the photon maximum time can spend here is 10 times the distance between these elements. So if you know the distance uh, between these elements, the distance is D, uh, distance to the mirrors is d over two, so round trip it's also d. You can calculate average time that uh, this uh, photon can spend inside the uh, unit, and if if during this time you can preserve the coherence inside, so coherence, as you remember, means indistinguishability of where the photon is inside here. It's similar to like a laser cavity. You know the size of the cavity and the radiation inside is coherent. So you don't know where the photon is inside this cavity. So if you can do that, then you can represent this unit as the coherent scattering center. It's probabilistic, of course, stochastic, Poissonian, but it's a scattering center such that it has a vertex and three edges and the photon can come from any of these edges and leave through any of them. So that's what is called the uh, directionally unbiased unit. And of course, since we have three, so it could be three input uh, states, like the vector of the input vector can have three components, A, B, and C. But the output, it also can have A, B, and C. So it's a three by three matrix connecting input and output vectors. Now, what kind of, that's this, this type of matrix. So you have input state uh, with A, B, C, and you have the output A, B, C, and they are connected through the matrix U. The U matrix strongly depends on what kind of phase shifts you select inside. It's tunable. For example, you can make a matrix uh, that is, um, uh, uh, how to say the has uh, equal amplitudes everywhere. You see, uh, basically, it's uh, if you square this up in terms of probability, it will be one third, one third, one third, and everything is one 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 third. So it's uniform. However, and this is for the pi over six phase shift. However, if you take the phase shift at this phase shift to be minus pi over two you can realize this matrix. This matrix has an interest in uh, properties and it's called the Grover matrix, Grover coin matrix. Lof Grover, who is, the, who is the founder of the quantum search algorithm in quantum information processing, designed uh, this matrix uh, and he showed up that uh, if you have a quantum walk on the network of nodes and each node realizes this matrix, then the information propagates faster through that network 
in comparison to the uniform matrices to be in the nodes. And we'll come back in this in a minute because when uh, you have three by three matrix, the Grover coin looks like this. Now it's not very kind of nice looking matrix, but anyway. So the bottom, bottom line, if you create this type of structure, if you preserve the coherence within the time required for photon definitely leave the unit, you can have a probabilistic scattering center uh, with three by three matrix that you can control. So that was our original idea. And uh, that uh, gave rise to several interesting applications and everything. So you can uh, check out uh, the, 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 those papers. Uh, well, first of all, uh, the system is operational. And uh, we tested this in experiment. Basically, we did this experiment with three by three unit. This is what's supposed to be uh, for the amplitudes. So the U is the, like in quantum mechanics, it's a matrix for amplitudes. You can build up the matrix for probabilities out of that. And this is the result of the measurements. As you can see, the elements of this matrix are pretty close to one third uh, that comes from here. One third is the normalization coefficient for each of the elements. And that's what we obtain in experiment later. As always, the experimental measurements come with delay from the theoretical consideration. That's normal in uh, physics and in engineering as well. Well, uh, what you can do with those units. So now we have unit, as I showed you, three by three. However, in principle, you can generalize this and make a unit like this with A, B, C, and D inputs. That would be four inputs and four outputs. So this is four by four system. Well, the um, properties are exactly the same. The photon can come in, it can go through this system, it will experience some reflections and some will probability of leaving 50% uh, leaving at every interaction with the beam splitter. So after several interactions, it will definitely leave this system. So you can consider it as a scattering unit. What you have to do, you have to make sure your physical implementation of this preserves the coherence within this time. So then you can treat it as the also four by four scattering uh, unit, totally reversible and uh, unbiased. So you can come from any port and you can leave through any port because you have four ports, your initial input vector is four dimensional and output vector is also four dimensional. What you can do with that, there is lots of lots of interesting um, effects uh, based on some interesting structures of graphs. So you can do topological effects, for example, because you know if you make a complex structure like this and within this structure, for example, as you can see, there is like hexagonal structure here. And this hexagonal features are, happens to be pretty stable because they associated with the topology of the structure. It's not only just scattering at each center, but uh, some kind of uh, topological features. And uh, also several other applications are available. Uh, we commented on some of them on our, in, our, in our papers around that time, but uh, there are many more to investigate, I believe. And uh, also the one interesting uh, application was, uh, I was uh, thinking about, like at that time, two years, three years, four years ago already, I guess, there was the, the machine learning artificial, artificial intelligence just uh, was coming into the play. And uh, the, the internal structure of the machine learning, as you remember, there is a bunch of nodes and the information goes between them. They really like scattering centers with variable parameters. And we're still interested, uh, we didn't go that too deep in there, but we're still interested in trying to see if we can potentially replace uh, software-based uh, scattering uh, in machine learning with uh, optical implementation of that using multi-dimensional scattering centers. It's another interesting application. 
All right, so that was the introduction. So now let's go to discuss uh, uh, two interesting effects. First, Hongo Mandel uh, effect. We all know Hongo Mandel effect is one of the kind of uh, foundational entities of quantum optics. What is this? Basically, it's based on the use of the beam splitter and two photons in the correlated state. What does it mean, correlated state? Correlated state, it's right here. It tells you that it's one photon in mode one and one photon in the mode two. That corresponds to this picture. One photon in mode one, one photon in mode two. They come to the beam splitter, and then the beam splitter, as you remember, is the Hadamard transformation. And <clears throat> uh, we uh, can find out what is the output state between for the mode three and four. Okay, this is the input state. This is the application of the beam splitter. That's what this means. And then this is the output state. And when you do that, what you discover is, obviously, uh, when you have the beam splitter in classical optics, you have four probabilities. Two photons goes here, nothing here, vice versa. Two photons in the mode four, nothing in the three. And then there are two options when one photon goes in three, one in four, or vice versa, four and three. So this is like one, two, three, four probabilities here. But uh, uh, Len Mandel uh, showed that uh, if your photons are perfectly indistinguishable and coherent, these two terms will cancel each other because of the sign minus in between them. So indistinguishability means that this term and this term have absolutely the same parameters. The weight in front of them is the same. Their spectral temporal parameters are exactly the same. And when it, it's correct, then this minus sign just cancel them completely. And when it cancel them completely, what's left? And it's the same as right here. These two probabilities are gone. So you have only two photons going here, nothing in the four or vice versa, two photon in the four, nothing in the three. Right here, two, zero, zero, two. Well, uh, it's like coupling of photons and then uh, experimentally it has been shown. So you have a source of entangled or correlated photons like uh, the one I've shown you during the first lecture, one photon goes here, one photon go there they always like go in pairs at, at one single time. There is one here, one here. Then they come to the beam splitter. It realizes this situation. And then you do the detection. You take this detector, this detector and measure the coincidences uh, that will tell you whether you had photon here or not and here too. So why you do coincidences? Because as you can see here, there are two modes, two outgoing modes, three and four. And the uh, Hongo Mandel effect tells you that would be two photon in one and zero in the other. When you have this situation experimentally, since there is zero photons in the mode number two, you cannot make coincidences. You can only make just two photons going in one of the detectors and the second one is empty. There is no second pulse on the coincidence circuit that can give you coincidence, which resulted in the dip in the coincidence, in the probability distribution here. So this probability is a probability of coincidences. So uh, when you are perfectly aligned here, when these two, two photons are totally indistinguishable, and when these two terms are canceled completely, then uh, you have no coincidences. So the probability to get coincidences is zero. When you start to uh, move these two photons slightly, change their parameters, you can go higher, 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 higher right here. And here they are absolutely distinguishable and your coincidences are not modulated anymore. You have all terms contributing to that. And this is perfectly classical case on the shoulder of the Hongo Mandel dip. So that's what the Hongo Mandel effect is about. And uh, we all know it plays a central role in multiple quantum information processing and quantum meteorology applications. It's a basically 
uh, subject for uh, another length lengthy lecture. So uh, what I want to uh, talk today about is the extension of this effect and want to analyze and show you what interesting thing happened when instead of this four uh, regular beam splitter with Hadamard transformation two by two matrix, you introduce four by four reversible totally unbiased unit uh, multiport that I told you about. This is the multiport design of based on the principles I described in the beginning such, with phases selected inside in such a way that it, the matrix connecting input in output will be Grober matrix. So as you can see, for the uh, Grover matrix has particular requirements and you can find it in any textbook on the quantum information. There is particular relationship uh, for Grover matrices, but in the case of four, when it's four by four, it takes a very symmetric form. Remember, just let me show you for three, as you can see here, it's not very symmetric. It's still grow a matrix, but it's, it's not kind of very nice and symmetric. In case of n equal four, four port, that's what happened. And you can, so all what I will show you after that, it's really consequence of this symmetry. That's what we discovered, <laughs> well, almost by accident. So we're studying and then we saw that feature and then we realized it's a consequence of symmetry of this matrix. So we have four by four uh, multiport, directionally unbiased, uh, A and B input, C and D output, or vice versa, because it's unbiased. And the matrix associated with this multiport is this matrix. So some foundations of that you can find in this paper cited below. Okay, um, let me just, uh, yeah. So Grover matrix input. Let's put input uh, one in A, one in B. This is the similar input to the uh, Hongo Mandel experiment. One photon comes in the A, one photon comes in the B uh, mode or entrance. So. Then uh, they experience the multiport scattering defined by this matrix. If you do the math, you discover very interesting thing. That's what will be available. So after the one one input state comes here, it's only will result in the probability amplitudes going to the left and to the right and there would be no cross terms as you can see it's a and b going backwards and c and d going to the right so left moving right moving but there is no any cross terms the state got separated on the left and on the right but it's not photons it's probability amplitudes distributed between these two rails we can call it like two rail system. All right. So what other interesting thing is uh, the uh, interaction of this uh, multiport. Uh, so first of all, uh, this is the first step scattering. So real photons are in the red, green ones, it's probability amplitudes like C, A and B, C and D. It's not uh, probabilities and probability amplitudes or amplitudes of the wave function. So um, left going and right going. Now, what happens if you put a next one right here, a next multiport right here, and next multiport right there? So we discovered that, uh, for example, if you have this type of the state with A minus B, that was the reflected one right here, when it sees another multiport, it will just get reflected. So 
uh, when the sign between A and B minus, when the such state arrives to port, it gets reflected. If you have the uh, A plus B come into the multiport, it gets transmitted. So what is the plus and minus? A, it's a, a, it's a, this line of the double rail. B is this line of the double rail. I already start building the foundation for the network. So like double rail. For us, originally, it was just input output of the multiport, but you can I especially group them in pairs because they make rails of the future network propagation. So minus means probability amplitude at A will be will have minus relative to the b plus it will be pi phase shift so by placing the extra pi phase shift in one of this relative to the other we can change this sign as a result we can force the probability amplitude either get reflected from the next one or get transmitted and this is the elements of building future interesting effects so uh just a second let me uh just talk about this so now we come into the higher dimensional hongo mandel experiment so conventional hongo mandel occupies both special modes like this this and it goes like this two and two but only two of them right one and two that's all what we have now we have a system of multi-port that i discussed what we need to do we have to add two elements beam splitters beam splitter here and beam splitter here. Why do we need beam splitters? Because I've shown you that uh, a relative to the multiport, uh, we have um, well, like between two rails, it's a distribution of probability amplitudes. In order to detect something with detector, you have to convert it into the uh, probability the probability is something that carries the energy that can be detected by the photo detector, for example. So, um, and uh, these beam splitters are normal ones with the matrices. And one can show that if we introduce this uh, two photon state, one in A, zero, one in B, zero, how we do that here, as you can see these uh, circles right here, they are optical circulators. So the photon comes in and by the circulator rule, it goes inside. When the photon will go backwards, it will go directly to the beam splitter just because this is the circulator. That's a rule of the circulator. You come here, you got from this output. You come here, you go from the other output of the circulator. That's how it works in telecom everywhere. It's a normal optical circulator effect. Okay. So, and uh, so let's look what happens. So A and zero, B zero is input state. M, it's action of the multiport that we discussed before. So it gives you this probability of amplitude. This is a reflected state. This is transmitted part. So two, two photon probability amplitude on the left and on the right. And now you see these dashed curves here showing. So now they come into the beam splitter. Beam splitter here and beam splitter there. This is what defined here as the action of the beam splitter. That's just a kind of notation. There are formulas behind that that you can find in this paper, Cal calculations all there. So what is the result? The result is that if you have this, you would have your final state going out of this system will be minus E naught squared, minus it means reversed coming from the terminal E naught, Square means it's already probability. It's not probability amplitude because E is the probability amplitude, but square, it's already energy. It's probability. And F1 square. So it means in this mode. So two photons can come either here or there, either from the E naught or from F1. Okay, so still only two of them, right? But we have potential here. We have one, two, three and four output modes. So can we do something about that? Yes, we can introduce phase shifter here. And remember, oh, we discussed that phase shifter can change the distribution of probability amplitudes in here. So one can show that if you put a pi phase shifter right here, 
then uh, your uh, the probability amplitude going to the right will still be the same as here. So these two photons will appear on this side. However, the reflected portion will experience the pi phase shift before it enters the beam splitter. You see here originally there were no phase shift, they were coming from this port. Now with this pi phase shift, they will come with the opposite port. Okay, so you see we already executed modulation of Hongo Mandel experiment. So now originally two photon here or two photon here, two zero zero two E naught F1. Here we go now two zero zero two between two pairs of different ports. It will be F naught and F1. If we put phase shifter here and there, now we can also switch uh, the output of the second uh, port or uh, beam splitter ports. So originally no phase shifter, they go to the top. With the phase shifter, it's a pi phase shifter, just sign change, they go here. So now we already have three and uh, the fourth case is this. So what do we have? We now introduce two photons inside the multiport, then the probabilities goes left and right. And by introducing phase shifts, we can control at which output ports, four of them, we can execute 2002 state, uh, zero state. So first it's like Hongo Mandel, 2002, but it's not between two, it between four spatial modes, one, two, three, four. So basically, and since we can, you all know that basically phases you can control. So in reality, this is the first time we realize you can do the switch of amplitudes such that you can change the distribution of quantum state between different users. So four different users, like four different uh, modes, and you can change it. You can say 2002 state will be shared between these two modes, these two modes, this or those. So that was the uh, high order, higher order Congo Mandel effect. And uh, this effect uh, could serve as a four port quantum state switch. So that's the first interesting result uh, that uh, we obtain. The other interesting thing is, uh, sorry, uh, if you add one more multiport, so that was the first one, as you see. So we take two photons, we introduce them in the first multiport, and then we start following the amplitude. What happens? So remember, when they come in, then one half is reflected, one half is transmitted, no cross term, they're perfectly separated. This one is going to the left, sees the beam splitter, comes out of this port. Now, what happens with the right going amplitude? The right going amplitude goes to the second beam splitter and because it has positive sign between them, it goes through this beam splitter. Uh, it sees this, uh, sorry, this multiport, sorry. It goes through this multiport, then it sees the beam splitter and it shows up as two photons. This probability amplitude converts into real probability of detecting two photons outside uh, this port. And the other one is still propagating there. So it's kind of modification of Hongo Mandel effect. It's still 2002 but at different time steps. What is good for, the interesting thing is, okay, if by any chance, what at this stage, I put the pi phase shifter. So this left one is reflected going out, but now this one is propagating here, but now with the pi phase shifter. Remember I was telling you that if you change the sign between these two probability amplitude and when it comes to the second multiport, it now will get reflected, not transmitted. So this gets reflected, it comes here, it goes through this guy and it will show up later in the different port here. 
So it's still 2002, but separated by the kind of several time beams where each beam it's a step, uh, the distance between elements here. So it's a very interesting kind of inter interesting effect, uh, kind of temporal parameter can be involved in the modification of Hongo Mandel. Uh, and again, there are multiple degrees of freedom here to play that gives extra dimensionality to Hongo Mandel experiment. So that's what it is. Now, uh, the unit, the multiport unit I've shown you is really uh, symmetric relative to polarization. It works exactly the same for horizontal and for vertical polarization. So uh, in principle, the same type of um, behavior can be shown for polarization states. And uh, the most interesting states of two photons and polarization, as we discussed during the first lecture, is entangled state. As you can see, this is a superposition of two elements and correlation between them, stable phase relationship, either plus, or minus. And here it's also, it could be a horizontal, horizontal, vertical, vertical. It's a phi state or psi state, H, V, V, H. So um, that's the first thing. Second thing is uh, with the development of uh, quantum computing, we all know that uh, the idea came about that you have to share entanglement between different nodes of your system between different users. Why? Because, for example, if you have one quantum computer in one node and second computer in the second node, uh, and you would like to communicate between them, send information, because they are quantum computers, their outcomes are quantum states, entangled states. Entanglement is the major resource of quantum computing. So you should be able to take entanglement from one node and transport it to the other one without losing this entanglement. So nowadays, when people talking about quantum networking, it's really about transferring entanglement between different nodes of network, because all other problems like secure communication, quantum cryptography has been studied so long time and already well developed this area of entanglement distribution is still pretty fresh and requires development that's where interest scientific interest is so why do you need this so you can do like entanglement swapping or and the idea is to have like distributed network of users uh, and you will have to transfer energy uh, entangled states between them without entanglement distraction that's a goal question can we do something about that using the system that we discussed? Okay, so as I told you, so originally what we did, we take the multiport and remember there were like two circulators inserting uh, photons inside the uh, multiport. Well, it's, it's, it's not the most uh, useful, uh, most convenient way of inserting uh, states. It will be more interesting to take two photons and insert them here through the beam splitter. So you take one here, one here, and let's go in this unit and see what happens. Well, it behaves slightly different than before because the topology of interactions is slightly different. You may recognize that if you have one photon here, one photon here, that the state after the beam splitter will be 2002 state. Hongo Mandel effect, a regular effect at this beam splitter, tells you that distribution of probability amplitude between these two guys will be two photon here, zero there, or vice versa. And then this state is getting introduced in multiport. The multiport here spread it again in two sets of amplitudes. And this one can go here and this one can go there. And mathematics shows that you will end up with one photon living on one side, one photon living on the other side. Well, uh, the difference here is, uh, it's different from what I've shown you before, but it's because now our input is different too. The input is uh, different from the previous case. In the previous case, we were introducing photons like right here and right there through circulators. 
here we're just coming from one side uh, so and you will see why it is so then the one photon goes in this branch one photon goes in that branch all right uh well and uh oh, by the way so we still have a choice as you remember to put phase shifters here 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 so by putting the phase shifters we can change the outputs uh, of these photons uh, to go out in from different ports we also had shown that if instead of just two correlated photons you will have a two entangled photons the not only like one one and that's all the state that has one one plus or minus one one with different polarizations when you introduce them in these two ports what happened is you will have them you can have them coming out from different ports this or this if you put phase shifter here it will be this or that if you put two phase shifters it will be this here this there and this and this but they still will be entangled well if your network is uh, uh how to say it's not noisy if it's support the entanglement does not destroy the entanglement through the when it's propagating through your system these two outcoming outgoing photons are still preserving phase relationship between these two terms and they're still entangled so even the single unit right here can redistribute the original same entanglement between different sides of those elements you see here is the foundation for distribution of entangled states so uh what you can do uh this was the unit that we described now we can keep building up adding units like this so and you can show really that when you add more of these units then you can uh, lead those uh, photons to appear like right here and right there for example and they still will be entangled if you change the parameters of phase shifts between the different units you can from here to here make it from here to here or from like uh, this place to this place remember you can also uh, change the uh, reflection uh, into uh, trans transmission into reflection so you can uh, navigate where your photons will go so uh, th th this also shows that this unit can uh, react on not on two photons on one photon as well so it's just four different options what you can do with the photon one it's always comes from this bottom e naught port but it can end up in different places here 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 so it's like a switching of network elements what is the result the result is let's say you have input circuit here this is two in one are two photons that form entangled state they come in in here then you basically you have control full control you can keep them propagating together for example like uh, I've shown you before, uh, oh, like like right here, yes. Uh, so you see, they propagate simultaneously in both directions together. Or at some point, for example, you can use this technology. One of them will get reflected, one transmitted, and then, like you see, the green photon comes here, get reflected, and goes here, 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 and you can deliver it to this node. The red photon, this is input. It comes here, then goes here, 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 and it ended up at this user. So each node here, it's a user of the network. So this technology, this universal switching between photons without losing the entanglement allows you to take initial entanglement and send it to any two users in the network. So your for example this like uh i don't know like quantum computer at this node one uh, someone has a quantum computer in this node and want to uh link together two quantum computers one at this one one at that one so that's what this uh, person will do will take this entangled state send it between two now they are entangled 
those two. And if each one of them has uh, its own quantum computer, then it becomes a distributed network of quantum computing. So that's how the potentially the network of quantum computing can be built. So uh, uh, then uh, how to make it? You have seen the circuit is four by four. There are a bunch of beam splitters, uh, phase shifters, and so on. And uh, basically, originally, uh, our idea was, well, the, the initial experiments was done using bulk elements. And we realized very quickly that uh, we cannot do more than three by three bulk in bulk elements. And uh, even that was very challenging in terms of experimental stability and everything. So it needs to be shrunk down into the microchip in nanoscale circuitry. And uh, conventionally, the, uh, we all know, so the beam splitter is just a coupled waveguides. Uh, and uh, there is a technology that allows you to take the piece of glass, for example, and use focus femtosecond laser and go around and in the focus, the refractive index of the glass is getting mo modified. So they really form like waveguides with modified uh, refractive index uh, that creates the waveguided properties. So now you introduce the photon here, it goes through the beam splitter, another beam splitter, another, and so on. However, for our purposes, we need like mirrors and phase shifters. And it's a little bit difficult to introduce it using this technology, or it becomes really cumbersome, really lots of lots of additional elements. So we switch to the uh, different modern technology. It's called the inverse design. It has been originally introduced uh, by uh, Elena Vukovic from Stanford in the classical optics of um, telecommunication switches. The idea is much more simple. If you want to have some device, scattering device, and you have to, you know what kind of outcomes you have to have at each of the output. Then you ask yourself a question, what would be the distribution of semiconductor material, spatial distribution of semiconductor material relative to these four waveguides inside so that boundary conditions will be satisfied? That's why it's called the inverse design. You start with final, with end result, distribution of probabilities and probability amplitudes at these four ports. And you go back and design uh, the... Um, distribution of materials that satisfy. So it's, it's like this, it's a result of the simulation. So input, 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 and basically you have to say, okay, this uh, has to be equal probability, a four by four port, realizing Grover matrix, as I have shown you. Uh, and uh, that's what we're doing right now. It has a little bit less control of the particular elements inside there, but it's much more compact and much more stable than uh, if this would be made out of discrete or even miniaturized uh, elements. So completely different principle. Instead of controlling a bunch of separate elements, we just control the distribution of scattering environment to satisfy outside boundary condition to, be, to form a matrix of Grover. So like come here, come here, come here or there, and this will ensure that the outcome at each of the port will be in accordance with the Grover matrix. Well, this is uh, right now it's uh, under construction. Uh, my students are trying to do this and uh, hopefully we can show some interesting results pretty soon. All right, so uh, at the end, I would like to thank the agencies that support this research. Um, and uh, thank you very much for your attention. And I'll be happy to answer questions. Thank you very much for this excellent talk. There are some questions in, in the chat. Have you seen? Uh, just, Can you read them? Just, just a second, hold on. Uh, I, I cannot see the control panel right now. Uh, oh, I can do that. Let me stop sharing uh, because mm -hmm. I cannot see the, okay. 
So here's the chat. All right. Let me go this create. Okay. Creating physical A and N is really amazing. So uh, what is A and N? I just I did not understand. Yeah, okay. So uh, yeah, if someone who asked Amra, this question. Amra, will you please explain? Ah, it is difficult. It is artificial, uh, artificial neural, neural network. network. Okay, good, good, good. Yes, that's an interesting thing. I uh, I would love to continue that because this uh, topic is uh, how to say the neural networks uh, is a very interesting topic these days, and there are already a number of suggestions how the photonics can potentially contribute to the neural networks, and uh, so far. There are lots of suggestions, not too much solutions. So that's why we're trying to approach this problem from our perspective and hoping that something interesting will be coming there. Yeah, that's a very good, I agree. Great uh, subject to, to investigate. So, okay, uh, the programmatic elements, if they are a complex number, they're always complex numbers. They always have my amplitude and phase. It just the phase is the same for all of them. Yeah, they are complex numbers. Oh, it, because uh, you see the Grover matrix in our case, it's a, a matrix applied to probability amplitudes in quantum mechanics and in quantum, probability amplitudes are always magnitude and phase. It's like in wave function. That really makes it challenging to realize this thing because if you're doing the classical mat scattering matrix, it's just amplitudes. Then it's, it's, it's an interesting problem, but it's doable. That's what uh, Yelena Vukovic started with. For telecom, you don't need phases. You just need distribution of intensities between the outputs of the splitter or coupler or whatever, like multi-wavelength coupler. You have to make sure what, different wavelengths go into different fibers. They don't care about phases. In quantum mechanics, you care about phases. So uh, what it results in the number of boundary conditions doubles. You need to have four amplitudes and four phases. And that's what you do. So you have to go back and make sure your system um, ensures that the four outcomes satisfy not only equal amplitude, but also equal phase. So that's the answer to this question. But they always complex number in quantum mechanics. Okay, can multipores be used to improve KLM scheme? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, the KLM scheme has been uh, uh, made uh, to try to bypass the major limitation of photonic quantum uh, information processing. And this major limitation is the fact that you cannot measure the photon state without killing it. Because when you do the standard, if you try to implement control not gate, that is a basic uh, element for quantum information processing for quantum computing, what is a control not? You have two qubits. One is the control, one is the target. You, you have to find out what is the state of the control. You have to test it. And then depending on the state of the control, zero or one, you do something on the target or you don't do anything on the target. That's what the control node gate is. But if your control is a spin, you can detect the spin of the electron. You can detect the spin of superconducting current, but still, they still exist. If you detect the state of the photon, you absorb it and you kill it. So basically, you don't have your control qubit anymore. It's gone. Yeah, you, can, you know that you can do something on the uh, target, but you cannot do it anymore because the control is gone. That was the problem. What uh, K K uh, Neil Laflamme Milburn suggested to take the control and make a twin brother of this control. So now you kill one of them, you learn the state, 
but now you know what was the state and you act on the target based on that and this second one is still existing so instead of one photon you always have to have two and you have to detect one of them everything is okay except that number of uh, real estate elements detectors photons is growing exponential for every control node gate you need to have more and more and more so it becomes in, impractical so uh the answer to this question is um not really because uh there is no way we can use this to introduce the interaction because the Grover coin multiport that I've shown you, it's a unitary transformer. Unitary transformation means no absorption, fully reversible. So it does not substitute the uh, extra element in KLM, basically detection or nonlinearity because it's unitary. That's why the application we're suggesting is transportation of entanglement throughout the network, but without uh, modification of this entanglement. So that would be the answer to the question. Thank you. More questions, please. Uh, Ahmed to know is asking some questions. <laughs> well, actually, that's a good question. We haven't studied this yet. So we use the four by four as the two rail system because it uh, matches the uh, qubit and entangled state transportation. Uh, it's a very good question what would happen if you introduce more than one uh, uh, entangled state well actually we started to yeah that's actually a good question so uh, at some point we ask ourselves a question so it was for the three port three port uh, and then uh, you see like so far i was talking about one photon at a time going through each of the ports right However, entangled state, it's a state of two photons, right? It's a two qubit state, uh, one in one state, one in another, or superposition of that. Now, if introducing this in, you have to use two ports simultaneously. But like three ports, because they're completely unbiased, you can do that. You can put two here and then see where it goes. What we did, we take this, we took this three port device and we introduce one qubit through A and B, second qubit from the B and C, and try to um, measure the output from A to C. Because input and output have to be uh, entangled states, states of two photons at the same time. Well, uh, it's a very interesting uh, thing. So, but uh, we discovered an interesting effect that this three port system can be used as the kind of mod, uh, how say, modifier of entanglement. You put two entangled states and the entangled states that live in this system can de de depends on what you put in inside. So you put psi state and phi state and then you can uh, identify what state will be leaving. It's more like uh, uh, not operation. Like, you know, when you have the for regular bits zero and one, you, you can make a true stable. One here, zero here, what will be the output? Zero, one, what will be the output? Here, we created a true stable. Uh, one bell state here, one bell state here, what is coming out? It's a very interesting topic. However, we didn't do that for the four, four by four, and it's interesting question. It's unstudied yet. So who knows, maybe something interesting will come out of that. That's a very good question. Thank you. Another question came for, from Bedri Hauci. Uh, 
Uh, what about having a two by two grover? Well, uh, two by two grover. Uh, well, to 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 realize uh, uh, to realize uh, the unbiased scattering element, you can use different physical principles. Uh, we published a review in the Journal of Entropy. Uh, well, if you go on my website, uh, in the publication sections, I have all of them in PDFs, just click and download it. It was about 2020, I believe. There is a big review of uh, several possible ways of executing the um, reversible units. Of course, what you can do, you can have first beam splitter, and then for the photons that live in, put mirrors and reverse them back. And in principle, it will be a kind of tangible realization of the system. It will have its own limitation, not totally universal, universal but it's possible. You can do it in the free space, you can use, in, use it fiber, and you can even do three by three. It's also possible. Uh, when you go four by four, it becomes a little bit more complex. Uh, and you cannot realize, uh, well, in addition to this, also you can do this with uh, uh, coupled waveguides also. A system of coupled waveguides can be used for the uh, scattering in quantum mechanics. So yeah, you can, you can do two by two. Uh, question is how useful it is and how easy it is to make. So that's, uh, and again, the analysis of this technology is present in that review. So you can see which alternative is easier and will be more practical. But in principle, yes, it's linear optics. Remember the um, uh, Rack Salinger statement original from 95, any higher dimensional matrix, unitary matrix, can be constructed using superposition of two by two matrices. So that's still true. Yeah, thank you. So I think Alexander have already tried, so, and there are no more questions. Alexander, Thank you very much once again. And please keep in touch. We are looking very forward to see you in person and to discuss um, eye by eyes all these exciting questions. Well, uh, thank you very much for the invitation. It's always my pleasure. Uh, and I would be delighted to come on occasion that would hopefully show up in the future and personal discussions are always much much more productive and uh, lots, lots of new good ideas can come out of that especially when so many smart people are in the room so i'll i do look forward to that thank you thank you that was a pleasure thank you very thank much yes yeah, thank you very much and thank you for everybody for coming and joining us all of students and young researchers so we stop here, close station, and see you tomorrow in the evening. Sasha. Okay, goodbye. Bye, bye.